And now I come to this evening's presentation. And so, okay, so this is what you've been waiting for. And I've gone through as quickly as I could of the business matters, mind you, some of them really interesting and significant. But tonight's presentation. So it's my great privilege to introduce one of our own fellows, actually, uh, Ian, Professor Ian Hickey, who has so many honors and uh, awards. He's a, a member of the Order of Australia. He is a fellow of, the, of our society, yes, of the Australian uh, Society of Social Science, of, of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia, of the Australian Health and Medical Society, and of the R Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Practitioners. I'm guessing. Psychiatrist. Oh, damn. <laughs> okay, I should have checked. Okay, so he's a highly distinguished person, but he's also a very well-known public public figure, and uh, you know I'm sure that you, you will you you will generally know him. He's co-director of health and policy at the University of Sydney's Brain and Mind Centre. He's a uh, he's an NH and MRC senior principal research fellow. Uh, excuse me, Ian, while I abbreviate some of these things. He's inaugural, he was an inaugural commissioner of Australia's National Mental Health Commission, National Mental Health, and he's an internationally renowned researcher in clinical psychiatry, a public figure of importance, and as I said, one of our own fellows. It's my absolute delight to ask him to speak on the topic of one of the best options for growing Australia's mental health through the COVID-19 recovery period. Okay, thank you, Ian. Over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. President and Ian, for the very kind introduction. And I really would do welcome the opportunity to speak with the Society for the first time myself directly. So it's a pleasure to join the Society I would say that I am myself sitting on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, where Sydney University, and we truly value their contribution to Australia's learning and teaching. And I might say that specifically in the mental health area, people may or may not be aware of the Indigenous concept of social and emotional well-being as one really of collective well-being. And I mean, somewhat in contrast to much of the individual kind of views that we have in Western society, and particularly relevant, I'd suggest, in the COVID era. You know, we can't individually be well and collectively be unwell. The goal is really to be collectively well and to maximise our functioning together. And I think the COVID period has really presented a challenge in that regard. So I'm going to talk about mental health and particularly the concept of mental wealth in that theory, what collectively we have that matters to our functioning, how that's been affected by the COVID era, what are the challenges, what, what might we learn, what might change, and what might go forward. And what are the same major sets of influences that are currently active in these areas that present real opportunities? So at this stage, I'm going to attempt to share my screen productively with you. I really want to talk about how we do promote Australia's mental wealth, what it was like in the pre-COVID era, the challenges that we faced, and what we now face in the COVID era as we go forward, hopefully now moving through some of the major challenges as we think about the future, how we might think about a better future as a consequence of that we've learnt along the way. Important to say, I'm going to talk a fair bit about technology and I am part of a spin-off company between the University of Sydney and PricewaterhouseCooper out of the particular issues, which is internationalising many of these areas. And I was a member of Australia's National Mental Health Commission up to 218, but the views I'm expressing are my own. There is this really important concept that the UK government of science, just prior to the previous financial crisis in 2009, really popularised of developing the mental wealth of a nation. And that collective idea, not just the individual mental health or cognitive health we might have, and the countries, particularly developed countries, but developing countries as well, need to learn how to capitalise on their citizens' cognitive resources. And they really need to think through what it is that matters. And a key kind of learning of the science at that stage was that really that little five word sentence at the end. We haven't really figured how to prevent a lot of the problems that we have, but we do need to move to a focus on earlier intervention at all life stages, not just early intervention in childhood, but early intervention throughout life at different stages to actually make sure that we support 
the mental health and mental well-being that we have. And the benefits are economic and social, if we think about it that way. And it's become quite popular, and I would suggest that many people may want to go and look at the original publication in Nature or the summary of the publication uh, by Bennington and colleagues. It's a really interesting kind of idea that mental wealth is something that individually we build across our whole lifespan, but collectively we need to build as well as we go. When we face both individual challenges or as we faced over the last 12 months, major social and international challenges. So what was the situation in Australia pre-COVID? If you were reading The Economist at the time, you would have said that uh, the Australian economy was booming. And in fact, in those boom years, it must be true that if the economy was booming, that our mental health was booming as well. Well, the reality was it wasn't quite so clear cut. The economy might have been booming, but we weren't necessarily booming as a mental health nation. In fact, in data just released uh, June 2020 about figures for 2019, it may surprise you to learn that by far the biggest loss of potential years of life lost in any health domain was to suicide and self-harm. So well over 115,000 productive years of life lost every year. And the next most important thing that people talk about all the time in terms of mortality, heart disease was back in the 70,000s and the various common cancers we're down in the 50,000s and lowers. So just in terms of sheer productive years of life lost, suicide and intentional self-harm has always been right at the top of those areas. And that's kind of interesting. When you go to years of life lost due to disability, then actually mental health and cognitive resources are way ahead in the disability stakes. But they're also huge losses in terms of potential years of life lost. So the economic and social consequences of that have always been large, despite the fact that we were doing well economically. And if you look at trends, in fact, in suicide data, we had a period that was actually very high back in the 1990s. And I'm often reminding younger people that, in fact, rates of suicide and self-harm amongst younger people were higher in the 1990s. I say that because that's pre-Facebook. That's pre the modern technologies. That's pre many of the factors that people now say are responsible for the difficulties. And those rates actually improved in the early 2000s. But in Australia and worldwide, Rates have been significantly increasing actually over the last 10 years, but particularly in the last five years. And not only has been an increase in rates, there's been increasing rates in younger people. We certainly have major issues in Australia continuing amongst Indigenous people, but also rates of self-harm and suicide have significantly increased in younger females, a group that previously we did not associate as being at such risk. So things were not going well in that particular period. Now, mental health is unfortunately one of those areas that is always perceived to be in crisis. So this week, if you've been watching the news, you'll have seen the Aged Care Royal Commission come out nationally. You may have seen yesterday the Royal Commission in Victoria come out, where that Royal Commission, which has been running for two years, described the mental health system as catastrophic in terms of its delivery. I've personally been part of Human Rights Commission's requiries back in the 2000s, other reports back in the late 1990s, continuously with various prime ministers and premiers about a system that doesn't deliver. And the National Commission that I was on till 2018 produced a report in 2014 about a need to really reorganise that system of healthcare, but create it within its wider social context. And it suggested to the governments at the time, the Turnbull government at the time, that what we needed was a productivity commission report. Always a danger in calling for another report. But the idea of a productivity commission report was to fundamentally rethink whether not just the health investments, but the social investments, the economic investments were in the right place to achieve the most good. Now that took a while. It took a while to convince prime ministers. It took a while to convince treasurers. Prime Minister Morrison was the treasurer at the time when this started. And this finally was delivered in the middle of the COVID period last year. And it set aside a whole series of issues that needed to be more significantly attended to. Prevention and early help for people, particularly young people, improved systems of mental health care, but beyond the health system, issues in welfare, in education, in employment support, issues in everyday workplaces that still needed to be there. And a rethink potentially of the funding systems that in our complex federation might come together. An emphasis again, which I'll return to a number of times on increased use of technology in the 21st century to increase access to care, but also the quality of care, but also to actually promote peer and community support. That finally got delivered in the middle of the COVID era. The government is still, uh, the federal government, looking at its national responses to that, 
in terms of what its responses will actually be. So in many ways, not a really great time to arrive in the middle of another national crisis. And I was doing some media this morning and someone asked me, well, do, hang on a second. Yesterday, there was billions for, or potentially billions, for aged care, another very difficult system. Mental health care, how much will it cost? Premier, uh, Premier Andrews made the comment yesterday in Victoria, it may cost billions to fix the mental health system. And that's billions plus billions then for aged care and mental health in a time when we face real economic challenges. I think the real issue is, yes, money needs to be spent in many of these areas, but unless we spend money wisely, we're in danger of just actually propelling on with what we've previously done, which hasn't worked very well. And there is a real challenge then as to design ideas, what really works, what delivers the best investment if we are to invest in these areas in the future. I think what we sadly have found out during the COVID period is when you face a really additional challenges, systems that don't work well, aged care and mental health, both of which have been the subject of independent inquiries for the last 25 years, but not really seriously attended to, fall apart most readily when faced with those wider social challenges. So to take the specific issues related to the COVID uh, situation, we're very fortunate in my work here at the Brain and Mind Centre that we were joined by Professor Joanne Atkinson and her group from the Sachs Institute who use dynamic system modelling looking at complex systems in real time. What is the interaction between things like economic policy, education policy, welfare, homelessness, psychological distress and suicide? What happens in real time if you have additional factors like COVID-19 and its impacts on economic recession coming into play? So in a lot of models that I'll present to look at these dynamic systems, big factors have to do with unemployment, expected unemployment, changes in things like social welfare, changes in the connectedness between us. So one of the big factors that we factor in is social disconnection, not just employment and education, but how connected are we in our communities to ameliorate many of these adverse mental health effects and bring that into play. Now, one of the interesting things about such modelling exercises is modelling, of course, suddenly became on everyone's lips with the virus, like how many people will be affected if we don't do something? What can we do, and people can remember this, Originally, it wasn't about eliminating the virus or eradicating the virus. It was simply about flattening the curve so there'd be enough health care to cope if the virus was overwhelming. But it was also a dynamic situation, simulating particular scenarios to help governments make decisions about what would be the likely impact. And you may or may not remember modelling that unless we went to significant lockdown, a little bit of lockdown really wouldn't help. You'd have to have quite a lot of lockdown to actually reach thresholds for effects. So that idea that actually you would use serious mathematical models where you can understand the virus, but more importantly, you can understand the social behaviours that you needed to engage in to mitigate those effects. Many people are surprised to find that those models are actually used in the mental health area and can be used in a similar way. And the complex interactions between factors like employment, education, welfare, homelessness and psychological stress can be looked at in terms of what might be the optimal combination of policies. They're complex systems, they are dynamic and they're changing, you can update them, but we would argue they should be just as much used in our area as they've been very effectively used to continuously inform government policy in the areas around uh, the virus and its particular impacts. So pretty much people would be aware of the notion of flattening the curve for the virus. We've been looking at what are, for example, for suicides, what were the best case and worst case scenarios before the government introduced JobKeeper or increased the payments under JobSeeker or supported other sets of situations, what would be likely to happen on an ongoing basis? Those models are generated from past data of what has happened in previous situations. Do they predict the past very well? And then used to simulate what might happen in the future. Now, to some degree, uh, in terms of media attention to these particular issues, people focus on how bad it could be our preoccupation is not necessarily how bad it could be, but how effective are the strategies to ameliorate it? You know, but take the COVID example, you can't make the virus go away, but what you do do can have dramatically different effects. As we've sadly seen in North America, if you pretend it's going to go away, you can have disastrous effects. If you're caught unawares as parts of Europe were and others, you have great trouble. Australia, we had the chance to actually consider other policies that might allow us to be in the much better situation that we are now in. The same is true in terms of the mental health sets of outcomes. 
So what we've been doing from those particular areas is actually taking the scenarios, um, just to go backwards, for suicides, and I'll show you for mental health presentations, for self-harm, for a range of other factors, we have had best case and worst case scenarios. When unemployment was predicted to go as high as 16%, or when participation rate, non-participation rates were already at 19% last year, you could end up with very dramatic increases potentially in suicides, in self-harm, in presentations of emergency departments, hospitalizations. And you could make estimates around those particular sets of factors. Not a lot of people wanted to hear that, but sadly that is the experience of the Great Depression, of the previous economic turn towns, of the Asian financial crisis, not acting and pretending it's not going to happen isn't helpful. What you might be able to do to ameliorate the effects is likely to be helpful. And to what extent, what combinations of policies might be most effective. Important to say, in the first instance, we said to governments, some things that you might think are really good actually might do nothing. Now, to show you how ineffective we are sometimes, the government went right ahead and did some of those things. One was an expansion of psychological care for sessions to see a psychologist. It was a very good thing back, and I was associated with this myself back in 2001, that psychological services did come under Medicare for the first time and were significantly expanded in 2006. But there was a limit on the number of Medicare sessions per psychologist and other allied health. And a lot of advocacy went on, well, we should increase the number. But in a fixed resource situation, you might imagine that the more you give to a small number, and actually you give that preferentially in the high wealth areas of our larger cities, you actually have an unintended consequence for others, which is less access. You've got the same number of people providing services. So a small number of people are probably better off, but a larger number of people actually are worse off in that situation mm -hmm. because they receive less care or they're a longer waiting list or they drop out of particular care. So something that could seem very well intentioned, the government announced last in October last year, is highly welcomed by some, but actually has no net effect on reducing these potential increases in psychological distress, presentations to emergency departments, self-harm, et cetera. Much to government's horror, some things can make the situation worse. So in particular areas, for example, like more public health campaigns encouraging people to get care might actually perversely make the situation worse. If many more people come to care and you have a fixed care system, then again, you actually get greater demand on that system. It can't respond. A lot of people in need of care actually drop out of care. They don't bother. They can't wait. And they result in worse outcomes on an ongoing basis. So again, something that seems entirely sensible actually has an unintended consequence. Again, that's exactly what government did. So even though it was presented with data that these two things might make the situation worse, because the popular politics of that is it sounds good and it's easily explained and seems like the intuitive thing to do, they've actually gone ahead and done some of those things. On the other side of the coin is actually, and I'm from the health sector, I'm from the mental health sector, often in many of my areas I'm in, people say, well, more mental health services is what we need if there are more people in trouble. Actually, the biggest debate we were involved in last year was what the government needed to do outside the health sector was by far much more important. And overwhelmingly, the most important thing the government did was introduce JobKeeper. So the fact that up to 3 million Australians are actually supported to stay connected to their workplace, even if they weren't going to their workplace, they had a job, they were connected with work, they had the possibility of going back to that work, they did not become disconnected and they didn't fear unemployment in the same way they would, that if the possibility was being postponed. We looked at the potential of increasing the JobKeeper program, not just in the first year, but the second year and ongoing, providing some confidence. Now, I don't know if you remember, but initially the government said they weren't going to introduce such a scheme at early in the crisis back in March of next year. Fortunately, not just in relation to the sort of um, issues that we were raising, but many other issues across the economy and from economic modelling suggested that would be very good. We in the mental health sector, in terms of the mental wealth of the nation, this was a critical decision. And you may remember, the government originally said it was going to stop in September 2020. The fact that actually the government didn't do that, that it continued to do that, I think was influenced by both the economic situation plus other work of this type of nature saying, actually, this is the most important mental health program you're actually doing. That and increasing the payments under Job Seeker which actually reduced the inequity in Australia and provided critical financial support and housing support to those who are actually really marginal in this situation. 
So the two most important programs from a mental health point of view were JobKeeper and JobSeeker. And we've been able to provide government with data about that. In a lot of conversations with key ministers to say, including the health sector, actually what you should be advocating for is mainly outside the health sector for the biggest effects and the longer they continue for the affected populations and considering they may differentially apply. We've been involved in saying that when you look regionally in Australia, areas like the coastal areas of New South Wales and, and uh, southeastern Queensland and other areas that were previously affected by fire and by drought and actually also have had higher rates of unemployment and already had higher suicide rates, these are the areas that need to be most supported. I think there are critical government decisions coming up with regards to ongoing support for hospitality, for tourism, for the aviation sector, and I might say for higher education that are critical in these areas where there are industries where these issues about employment support remain critical issues to be addressed, even if other areas of the economy are recovering. So unequivocally, we've been saying about confidence about employment, and it isn't just the money that goes with employment. It's the connection to a job. It's a connection to identity. It's a connection to the workplace that you're part of and some confidence that the government's going to stand behind and support. So although in one sense, very expensive and large and government continuing how long this should continue, by far and away, that has been the most important actual mental health initiative, well predicted by the models in terms of reductions. We've had a lot of discussion with government and others about what has happened as our models have run along. Unfortunately, as predicted by the models, issues related to self-harm, presentation amongst young people, amongst young women have increased and we're seeing increased pressure on emergency departments right across the country, consistent with the models. We haven't to date seen an increased rate in suicides, which is very welcome. And if you look at normally where suicides often play out in men, particularly between the ages of 25 and 60, they're the groups that have actually been most supported by JobKeeper and other programs. So we would argue they may well have been an amelioration. The government for that bit might've been effective for death by suicide, but a lot of the other issues related to self-harm, presentation, psychological distress have continued. When you start to look at what works best, what is the combination overall? There are things therefore about the economy. However, for young people in recessions, when there aren't a lot of jobs and they have lower skill levels and they're more dependent on hospitality, the creative industries, tourism, et cetera, much more casual workers, and for a lot of female workers in those particular areas, actually the issue of skills training becomes critical. So if you look at past recessions and et cetera, where do young people go and where do you want them to go to increase the chance that they will be economically productive or in my world, generate mental wealth in the future, you want them to go to education. So one of the arguments we're having actively with government is supporting education, not just school-based education, but post-school education and training. We have seen the federal government and a number of state governments put emphasis on training through the TAFE sector, the vocational education and training sector. That is very welcome. It needs to be tied to real experiences though. Obviously in the higher education sector, this has been much more contentious where it was decided that in fact, the government would not support JobKeeper in the higher education sector and make changes in fact, to the uh, way in which we people pay for degrees. We reckon that is not a good idea that actually support for education, higher education, vet training should be critical because it's the real alternative to employment for many young people in this area. And we want people to develop skills in those areas and particularly to think about skills in which there will be future jobs. And really not just the classical infrastructure, not just bridges and roads and railways and airports and the, and the building construction sector, which typically is the thing. And if there's one thing in Australia that drives me to total distraction is every time a politician talks about a job, they see someone in a high busy outfit and a hard hat as if the only jobs are in the trades and education and infrastructure sector. As distinct from the many jobs in the future that we do need in aged care, in healthcare, in childcare, in many other areas for which you need skills and training, in addition to the IT sector and many other the human services sector, where there are very good paid jobs and there's a great need for jobs development. So we need governments to be thinking smart about education and jobs for the future. We do need, however, an expansion in the mental health services sector. You may remember Greg Hunt made the comment when we thought we'd run out of ICU beds and ventilators for the virus, that he would immediately make available the national health infrastructure across the private and public sector. And deals were done to publish those health, uh, purchase those health services from private hospitals and others if needed. We haven't seen this extend yet to mental health, despite the increased pressure on public health, hospital emergency departments and other areas. 
So when you model what would work best, you need the economic factors to be in place. And the government has done a good job basically on the job keeper issues and on job seeker up to, or at least through 2020. Now we're into the much more contentious area about how that goes forward and do those who are most disadvantaged actually continue to receive support. So from our point of view, the reduction, well, the, the only small increase in job seeker is unfortunate. We would like to see greater economic support continue in that area. The job keeper issue may be an issue of how that is tailored to those in greatest needs and in the industries where there has not been a recovery to provide ongoing support. And obviously that's a live issue at the moment across our community. What we do need to see is a rapid investment in mental health services that work. And they are largely smarter, more specialised services using technologies outside of hospitals. They're not more hospital beds. They're more support for those with more significant problems on an ongoing basis that really need to be attended to in a very significant way. That's hard because we have not invested in that. It's really hard outside of city areas to do that. We haven't made use of technology effectively to support that. So largely outside of our major capital cities, we have major access barriers to more specialised and ongoing care. We haven't made use of technology to actually coordinate care in effective ways. We haven't followed up effectively those who've attempted suicide who've come through our emergency departments. So just like the aged care sector, we've had lots of holes that we haven't fixed. Lots of reports, and I've been the co-author of many of them myself, about what should be done, but not a lot of implementation of what could be done and doing it in the ways that we would see much of which highlighted yesterday by the Victorian Royal Commission after two years of inquiry. The Victorian Royal Commission up to this point, and there are five volumes of it, I've been checking with other colleagues today, interestingly, doesn't really include modelling exercises, doesn't really simulate what you would do, and in many ways doesn't specify what are the outcomes that we're really seeing, seeking. In a separate set of projects I'm associated with the BHP Foundation, we're doing that for young people across regional Australia. And very clearly, we're saying the outcomes that we are seeking to reduce are attempted suicide and presentations, but importantly, their increased participation. They are back to school, back to work. They're those things. Do the interventions work? Not just do we have more activity in the health sector or in other sectors, but do they achieve the outcomes that they need to? To do that, you need to intervene earlier and more effectively with certain groups of people in the key years of interest. So it's made very famous by our Australian of the Year in 2010, Professor Pat McGorry and his colleagues in Melbourne. It's critical that in the teenage and young adult years that you intervene early and effectively if you want to get those particular outcomes and that you actually have services that reach and connect with those people in effective ways. Much of health is very much a bricks and mortar type issue. You know, if you want to make something better in health, you go build a big hospital and you open it and you make a big new centre and you feel you've done something. In mental health, it's really the opposite of that. It's have you connected with people where they are in their lives effectively to assist them to get to care, but also to be back at school, be back at the university, be back in training and education, be back at work over a much longer period, over years, not days or weeks, to ensure you get those great outcomes. So the modelling we have, which is interesting because having presented this to government last year, the national government for the first time said, we've got to invest in modelling. <laughs> we've actually got to do what we've done. Rather than just keep picking programs randomly all over the place of unknown size, of unknown particular things. So, in fact, the national government has started to engage in these areas and has started to say, okay, we need to make use of these new methodologies, these mathematical approaches for complex systems to inform decision-making. I want to go from just the local situation and say what is happening then worldwide in this regard. Um, I remain a, a fundamental optimist about what can happen mental health wise. And much of my optimism is about what's happening elsewhere in the world, not just in Australia. An increasing recognition there's a great deal we can do at the population level for everybody, but also at the healthcare system level. And what are the priorities in that area? Not just to talk about the arrangements, the federation, the states, who's in charge, but what are the goals of these particular approaches? At the population level, it is productivity. Unashamedly, I'm not an economist, I am a psychiatrist, but unashamedly it's about productivity for its economic and its social benefits. And it has to be smart. One of the biggest areas in all of these areas is to understand diversity by regionality. Australia is not one place. And just reporting a national unemployment level or a national suicide rate is really unhelpful 
Suicide rates are three or four times variable by regions. They're not the same. Areas I'm going up to the north coast of New South Wales again this week are markedly different from where I'm currently sitting in central Sydney. If you go to Western Australia, if you go to other places in the country, if you go to the Northern Territory, really different populations, really different sets of challenges. You've got to think about what are the dynamics of populations at those levels and what factors really contribute on an ongoing basis. Regionality, having systems that are fit for purpose, that are appropriate to the populations under coverage, is a really critical issue internationally, not just in Australia. And, and aggregating a national statistics at times hides the reality of what needs to happen at more local levels. Uh, Simon Cream, when he was the Minister for Regional Development in Australia, used to have a map in his office of about the 50 functional regions in Australia. There's not the eight states and territories or one nation. There's about 50 functional social, geographic, economic regions, and that's the system which you need to think. How does the mental health, the mental wealth fit in with economic development and social connections in those regions and respond and plan with the people who live and work and conduct their lives in those regions? This kind of dynamic modelling and technology enhanced is fundamental to that. In healthcare systems, as my great friend and colleague Alan Fells often remarks, we are unapologetic in health planning, old Stalinists. We think we can plan things from the top down and tell you what to do and you'll do it and you'll be better off. And I might say there's a lot of things during the COVID era that have looked a bit like that, you know, from a public health point of view. Interesting, our public health law is generally over 100 years old. We'll just tell you what to do and you'll do it. In reality, it doesn't work very well. The whole of medicine is moving towards much more personalised models of care, active consumers, people needing to make choices, people needing to know what the options are. And in my own area, in the mental health area, people are incredibly variable. Things like diagnoses are poor proxies for their experience. Averages out of clinical trials don't translate well into individual delivery of care. We need smarter systems. And those systems are not in hospitals. They're longer term working with people. In those areas, working with technology to track care and to personalise care is a really critical development. And one of the most important things from my point of view is getting high quality care to places we would have never gone before. Technology is really important. So, you know, most of what people think is digital technology is usually some sort of medical record system now on a computer, which is really just a horse and cart type technology. What is really happening in digital health information systems is really the equivalent, if anyone's ever flown on an A380 in recent times, something really different. And you've got to think about it differently and the power of using technologies in the 21st century to drive health care and particularly mental health care in ways that we never imagined uh, and, and still don't really, most people don't really imagine what can be achieved, how empowering then that can be. So there's a whole notion of two, the digital health 2.0 in this area. It's not about record systems. It's not simple standalone apps. It isn't just taking what you ordinarily do and going online. Now we did have, and Greg Hunt did say, we had more progress in 10 days last year than we'd had in 10 years towards the use of technology in health generally and mental health through telehealth. That's true, but it was largely putting a better engine on a cart and horse. It was largely taking what I would have ordinarily done in my office and used a computer to do it through Zoom or through Microsoft Teams or whatever particular technology. It wasn't actually using the scale and the power of the technology. It was simply taking what I ordinarily did and connecting with you wherever you were in the same kind of way. The real innovations in technology here are much more personally controlled and interactive. They have high privacy standards. They're rapidly changing. It's not easy to do clinical trials. They change so quickly. But they're about highly personalised assessment and following in real time what is actually happening. They are actually systems that can be much more accountable and in many important ways, they're much more equitable. They can be actually scaled and taken to places, allowing like that our national broadband network and some other issues are attended to. They're actually issues that can go places that much of our person-based technology can't go. So basically, a lot of issues go on at the moment. Is this just a cheat substitution? You know, if we just put technology in for what we had, is it just an attempt to cope with COVID dislocation, et cetera? No. My answer would be actually it's going to win because it's actually better than the old systems. And it does better on access, getting to more people. It actually does better at quality because you can track individuals continuously over time. If things are not working, you can respond quicker. I say to people I work with all the time, it might sound like a funny thing to say, I don't care if you got better. 
I care much more if you didn't get better and you got worse and that we respond rapidly to deterioration in a situation and don't just put it off and keep doing the same thing. It can respond much more positively at the individual person level, not at the average level to get it right. There's tremendous amount of support, in fact, from a lot of people who are involved in this area, particularly at the user end, those who've got these experiences. They can see they're actually part of a proactive partnership in care. A lot of people who fund, uh, this is not so clear in Australia, but clear overseas with insurers, want a system that manages demand better, that's more accountable. From a community point of view, in my work with the National Commission and most other areas, one of the groups that complains most about the current situation are families and carers who are excluded from care. Confidentiality leaves them out. These systems, they can put information in all the time and also be active participants. The people who are those who wish to continue to have horses and carts rather than A380s tend to be people like me. They tend to be the providers of care. They tend to, like in all healthcare and many other industries, be those who are being most disrupted by technology, who are being most challenged to do things differently, that the way they've trained, the way they've become highly specialised may not be the best option for the future. So there's a great deal of debate going on in the technical areas at the moment about is this good or not so good? Many of the others, funders, users, families, think that in the right circumstances when done well, it may be a better solution. I'm part of a group with the World Economic Forum, Global's Futures Council, who've been very smart about digital transformation of healthcare. And I must say in my particular area, how the hell would you ever assist 8 billion minds? You know, how would you ever take quality care to the developing countries, the developing world? It sure won't be in the way that we've done in the developed world and still struggled. But actually, technology has the capability to do that. And a lot of discussions going on in developing countries don't do what we've done. Start with the internet, start with online connectivity and build education and healthcare from there. Don't start with the real estate model that we have seeing who can build the biggest hospital or the biggest clinic and then have great trouble actually providing care on an ongoing basis. And that's a really interesting thing through the World Economic Forum because it's much more tied to economic development, smarter 21st century healthcare and the powers of technology and being taken up by social ventures more aggressively and I must say by economic ministers more aggressively than typically by health-based people. The technology requires new models of care. It isn't just put the technology in. Healthcare has been quite resistant, in fact, to the use of new technologies. The providers are pretty much in charge of a lot of things in healthcare. So you've got to have new models of care. We've been arguing in the youth area, for those who are interested, we have a supplement in the Medical Journal of Australia uh, back at the end of 2019 about bringing in new concepts, better assessments, clinical staging, better understanding of pathways, but really using technology to assist the assessment, but the ongoing measurement of care over time to be more effective. What we've been looking at is how ready are healthcare systems to use those new technologies. In healthcare, we're terrified of change. In fact, we're very happy with what we know currently doesn't work. We're terrified if we change something, there'll be unexpected consequences. We've been looking at how quickly health systems can actually use technology-enabled care and what would be the effect. Technology-enabled care always outstrips any of the other business as usual or small increases in capacity. At the moment, the nation's thinking about, oh, where do we get more psychologists? Where do we get more nurses? Small increases in workers who just do what they're currently doing only have small effects on the actual outcomes of interest. Coordinating that care using technology has much bigger effects, something we're very reluctant to do. Uh, I must say, I was almost thrown out of Prime Minister Rudd's 2008, if anyone can remember, 2020 conference, because we were saying at the time, do not do my health record, the top-down national health record system, do personally enabled care. Of course, the government was committed at the time and is still committed to billions of dollars into a top-down system where the user is not really very interactive. It's information shared between healthcare providers and is not is a small advance over the existing systems. We've also been looking at actually what can you do? The challenge with technology, that, and people see this disruption of other industries, is you can't just add a little bit on. Actually, you need to go all in if you're going to make differences. If you actually go in with big changes, then actually you'll see big effects. 
If you try and just add it on to existing systems, and some, in some scenarios we have, just adding it on makes it worse. You drive everyone mad by adding a new thing on top of others. So I don't know about you, but every time I receive a new piece of technology from the university or the healthcare organisation, I receive, I've just got something else to do. You know, it doesn't really help. It doesn't really make it more efficient in its delivery. So there's a really big issue with technology, our willingness to change with new models, and do we really go and actually do it? Because being half pregnant really isn't going to deliver anything in this regard. So the quicker you do it, the more you go in, you see these big effects. If you go in and you go in and you try to do it significantly and you do it well, you'll get big effects. If you muck around and only pretend to do it, you'll really struggle to have an effect. And that's the danger in healthcare. Fear of making it worse tends to prevent us from making more radical changes. I've personally written elsewhere about the uberization of mental health care. If healthcare systems don't do it fast, other private providers will, and they won't necessarily be based in Australia. This is a worldwide industry. We made reports about, back at this back in 2014 about the need to get on with this. Government has been slow up until the COVID period to do that. Whoops. And at that stage, we were lucky that, in fact, Prime Minister Turnbull got involved in these areas. But it's actually this person who you won't know, who's a Colombian psychiatrist called Lara Spinopolinos, who was actually sitting in Colombia, in, in Bogota in Colombia, providing services to those in Broken Hill, New South Wales, child psychiatrist who'd never received services before. So in a marvellous piece of reverse imperialism, someone from a developing country was providing services to our citizens in New South Wales that we weren't doing. Our alternative model at the time was to fly a psychiatrist from New Zealand once a month to those communities, instead of actually working with communities and using technologies. I'll return to Lara shortly. We've been fortunate that in fact, uh, the Turnbull government did uh, back a project I'm associated with, Project Synergy, about looking about how to do these across Australian healthcare. And we've been involved in that in many different forms over the last three years to look at it. Basically, how do you take all the retail brands that we've got, combine them with the power of the internet to actually bring a whole lot of other technologies that are out there, peer support, apps, tracking mechanisms, personal monitoring devices, plus improved healthcare into the lives of everybody who might be attending those particular services. And really it builds on the notions that you need much more personalised care, and you need to track what happens over time. These are the two elements that translate to our favourite slogan at the moment, which is right care, right time, or even right care first time you come to our system, to which with the BHP Foundation work, we'd add where you live to get it actually to where you are so you don't have to keep coming to us over time. And with Lara's help, we've been building new clinics based on this, where young people come in and access care, the health professionals get involved in care, and then you get to see people like Lara for those who really have a high need to see professionals and build that in and actually become the, actually technology becomes embedded within smarter services, including access to high skilled professionals early in the course of care. One of the aspects I'd just like to finish with, I'm really proud of, is actually working with developing countries. So Lara, who came to Australia with her husband, couldn't work here, did a PhD with us, developed a lot of this technology, has now gone back to Colombia, and she's taken the technology with her. So she's actually taken our background technology, she's on the ground back in Bogota, even during the COVID period, actually introducing this technology on an ongoing basis and working with different universities and centres now in Colombia, we're part of a partnership supported by the Botner Foundation in, in Switzerland about those particular areas. We simply have work going on in Alberta, in Canada and elsewhere about how you can internationalise these issues, share technology, share expertise to reach populations that we've never been able to reach in the future, in the past. That work in the developing world is great. Needless to say, there's considerable work still to be done here in Australia. There's considerable work to be done here in New South Wales. I'm off to the Northern Rivers tomorrow as part of work up there, where there's a tremendous amount of primary care services, a great deal of interest in Indigenous populations, changing some of the futures of those areas by working with communities at a local level with the power of technologies, but also of regional partnerships. So I think, in conclusion, we can grow the mental wealth of Australia if we're smart, if we're regionally focused, and we make use of the opportunities that now exist in the 21st century. So thanks very much for your attention and I'll hand back to Eugenie to take questions.
Right. Well, Ian, that was just absolutely fascinating. I really uh, got so much out of it and I was I learned so much. It was just great. Um, I guess you raised an awful lot of questions, uh, actually, in my mind, but I will go to the questions that other people have put to me and perhaps I can get to ask my favourite question at the end. Um, Peter Bohm has asked or said, made the statement, which is not very nice, there is a bad history for, for psychiatry. We can think of deep sleep therapy, frontal lobotomy for schizophrenia, no effective treatment for schizophrenia, and so on. What can we do about this sad history in terms of what you have been talking about? Well, it's a great question. Thanks, Peter. So there's two bits to that. It's not the entire history. So one of the things is we got to tell a broader history. In fact, I was just about, if you go to the Lancet last year, um, there is more than that to the history of psychiatry. In fact, the history of psychiatry has many good aspects. In fact, and, in, and the arrival of effective treatments in the 1950s of the movement away from institutionalisation and social isolation to actually people starting to live their lives outside of that. In fact, back if you go to the John Kennedy era, is about actually an awareness of these issues. So we've had some bad bits along the way. But the development of better treatments, the better explanations along the way is part of that. So I think we have to be careful not to reinforce the stigma and discrimination and isolation by simply saying that is the history. But like every area of medicine, it's hard to make progress unless treatments improve. And I think the situation, in fact, from the 1950s and 60s onwards is part of that. I'm just in the middle of writing a book, Peter, about really the history of antidepressant treatments in other areas and people telling a more accurate history. And in fact, since the 2000s onwards, there's very good evidence about the efficacy of treatment, the benefits in terms of reduced suicide, but access to quality care is important. So when we've had a bad history, which is true, and aspects of that, or the misuse during the Nazi regime or in the Soviet Union and concerns about situations in China, et cetera, we need to see where psychiatry has been misused for political or other social purposes, which is not the normal history of it, but also I think in the continuing ways that we, that we deal with these issues, that in fact, the best delivery of care. So I would say the structural discrimination against mental health care, the lack of expenditure, the lack of investment contributes to that bad history. Very hard to make progress unless you're And I think what you see interesting in Australia and elsewhere over the last 20 years is a huge increase in awareness and acceptance, but it hasn't lined up with a huge increase in investment in evidence-based solutions. And I guess what I've been talking about is you've got to be smart about what you invest in. You have to see the wider social context and then you have to invest in quality care and be accountable for that. All uh, right. I've got another a question from Guy Laux. I hope I've got that right, um, who says, thank you very much for your presentation. The models are interesting given the potential social disconnection and the impact in the regional and lower connected areas within society, are there greater impacts there? In other words, have you modified uh, an area in Australia that's low socioeconomic and shown that potentially what you do in terms of education, at job seeker, et cetera, has had a greater impact? So the first bit, yes, we were lucky to be, the reason we were able to do this during the COVID pandemic is we'd been doing it for some years before and we just actually in February last year, just completed a major set of work in the Northern Rivers, which is an area of high socioeconomic disadvantage for people who know the area, people in the Clarence Valley and people around Kempsey and then there are people in indigenous populations. There's really big differences between Byron Bay and Grafton in terms of what happens in that area. And that area, to the great credit of Julie Sturgis, the head of the Primary Health Network, was really interested in investments outside of health. And so we've modelled with them investments in childhood education, in childhood social support, in reductions in trauma, in a whole lot of issues outside of the healthcare sector and for younger people, which are much more salient and the effects in their area are bigger for those longer term investments. Now, we've been doing that pre-COVID. So a lot of the things in mental health, the investments are outside healthcare, then they are in childhood disadvantage and in other areas, and in education in, in particular. Then what really upset the government at the time is we re-ran those for COVID immediately for those areas. And they were areas that had already been hit by the drought, 
and by the bushfires. So they're already going bad pre-COVID and then they had COVID. And so that set of areas, when we went back to the government and said, you know, in those areas, it's going to be worse, that the worst case scenario is worse because they're starting in a bad situation. Now, it's interesting, Canberra didn't want to hear that. Canberra wants a one size fits all type idea. We were going, forget it. It isn't a one size fits all. You're going to have to do things differently. Interesting, when, when Victoria went into its second lockdown, we reran the models for Victoria for higher social disconnection, for worse outcomes. And in fact, they have had worse outcomes for presentations to emergency departments as predicted. Again, the Canberra government didn't want to hear that. It didn't want to hear actually <laughs> the regionality or the adaptiveness to different circumstances. You know, not surprisingly, national governments like a one size fits all model, but that's been part of the problem. We're not a one size fits all nation. So yes, now we are tracking now, and just today I've seen models of the different employment um, outcomes by the national versus regional, et cetera. So for New South Wales, we did this. The solutions are different in regional New South Wales to urban New South Wales. The challenges are different. So the basic issue is yes, government doesn't like it. You know, and there's discussion again today, oh, what Canberra and Macquarie Street in Sydney will do together? Again, it's not really the question. The question, and the Productivity Commission raised this, the question is how are you going to get it together in regions and work with people over time to see that these optimal solutions that we are suggesting actually work in those regions. So it's a really big departure from business as usual. Um, thank you for that. I have another question. This is from Judith Wilden, which I would like to um, sort of reinforce. One of the big factors in funding of mental health must be community attitudes to come yep. And I guess um, the concept of mental wealth is a lovely idea. Judith wants to know how you're going to introduce that to the general public. Um, I all wanted to know as a write-on, because I'm particularly interested in aged care and the money that's going into aged care. If you improve the work, mental wealth, can you improve the mental wealth of the community by, by improving the mental wealth of the elderly? To take the last bit first, and I must say, as I'm on that curve, you know, I look forward to a better old age. Yes. In fact, yes. In fact, I've been involved in several discussions. Although some of the earlier intervention things tend to have a focus on children and young people, there are critical issues around life and actually much better mental health and welfare. In fact, the previous Minister for Aged Care, Ken Wyatt, had a background in community mental health and other areas and had, not well known publicly, prioritised the mental health and well-being of older people. Yes. And if you want people to survive well in their homes, they've got to stay socially dis socially connected, right? You've got to think about how communities function and the limits, for example, of musculoskeletal and other issues around mobility. So the use of technology. So a whole set of other um, papers that Eugenie, I'll share with you is our work with older people and modelling. So guess who some of the biggest advocates are for technology? Older yeah. people. Yeah. Guess where the biggest discrimination against the use of technology is? older people, right? There is a bit of an issue. You have to have, like I have children or grandchildren often to assist you with the technology at home. Yes, yes. Once you've once you've fit, left work, in fact, there's very interesting French data. You've got to now be about over the age of about 75 to have not had significant exposure to technology earlier in life. But as you age, so really the groups that don't want to use technology are really afraid of it now are quite elderly. I must say this, my 90-year-old mother has been a frequent user of technology for banking and other services continuously. If you have the support to use it, and then there is an issue about maintaining the connectivity. When it falls down, when it breaks down, how do you support that? So that's a really important set of issues Eugenia are raising. So the answer is yes, and the, there are economic and social benefits for that in older persons. So interestingly, in the Royal Commission set of issues, we have been involved again of raising the issue of technology. Now, I can't speak for the current environment, but Ken Wyatt, as the previous minister, was extremely interested in that. And Mark Butler, for those who remember when he was the Labor Cabinet Minister for Ageing and Mental Health, they were the two things he was responsible for. He said, great, i got two of the most difficult jobs. You know, forget health, ageing and mental health is much harder. Again, a big advocate for these areas. So I think that's a community dialogue we have to have. 
on an ongoing basis. The mental health concept, to ask the first part of your question, we had Prime Minister Turnbull using the mental health concept all the time. He, as a grandparent, was really interested in the investment in early childhood and cognitive development. And so we were part of a Prime Minister's working party at that stage on using technology. And my favourite thing was connecting grandparents with grandchildren through technology, you know, for the, for the mental health and wellbeing of both. <laughs> Right? You know, grandchildren do batch better in the care of their grandparents, and so do grandparents. You know, I am one myself. Um, so that issue we had sort of started with the, and we are lucky that Prime Minister Turnbull took that up. I think there is an issue in the wider community. You might have seen Premier Andrews yesterday talking about people saying, well, where are you going to spend money on mental health? Why would you spend it on that? And he said, because it'll save money. It's actually an economic investment. So I think we... I've got to sort of take that. Now, I don't want the mental wealth thing to just become a simple dollar productivity thing. It's more than that. And to go back to the Indigenous concept, it's more a collective concept, not just a, an accumulation of individuals. So we're into uh, developing metrics around that. And then I think there is the popularisation of that. There are good reasons for all of us to be in that, just as with our physical health and wellbeing. Stuart, can I ask one more question? Yes, absolutely. If you want to ask mine, feel free. I am going to ask. <laughs> Funnily enough, I had yours on my uh, list to ask Nick. Stuart has asked that the distributed community services and careful mathematical analysis of results sounds very much like the new Planet Youth Trial or what those planet, what the Planet Youth Trial programs are doing. Can you provide your views on the Planet Youth programs? And for my education, can you tell me what the Planet Youth trials are? <laughs> well, I think Stuart might have to comment on that. I, I oh, I mean, uh, sorry, the, the programs that have come out of Iceland um, encouraging teenagers to and are now being trialled in about six locations in Australia. Yeah, my well, my understanding is that kind of I want to, we need to see what kind of happens. I mean, the general thrust of the issues have been popularised and, and engaging. I mean, I think one of the aspects of this, which I perhaps didn't dwell on, is we don't just make these models up. They're co-designed with the community. So the background mathematics is sort of shared. But what goes into each regional model, what happens with people, and a different, just to come back to you, Ginny's point, different groups. If you're trying to engage young people, then how you engage young people in the design and delivery of these things matters a great deal. We're involved in projects with Indigenous populations, same thing. When dealing with older populations, same thing. So I think what lies at the heart of all of those programs is they're not top-down or generic. They actually engage that those groups that are meant to be those who principally benefit in the design, delivery, but very effectively in the implementation. Technology is a great example. The use of technology by young people is changing incredibly quickly. So what young people do with a smartphone and how they share it and the way it's used and the interactions, the peer support, is it is a particular issue. So I think those issues of engagement, I think quite wrongly, uh, there's often the idea that particularly young people are disengaged as distinct from we have not been very good at engaging with. To pick up uh, part of Peter Bohm's earlier criticism, which I'm very keen to debate with you later on, Peter, is that we have not necessarily been great in the past at engaging with people with lived experience of mental health problems as to what are their highest sets of needs, often which are a job and a home and a community, not necessarily a reduction in symptoms on an ongoing basis. You know, so there are a lot of issues in these worlds, which I think uh, you're basically uh, tapping into, Stuart, and, and that those particular sort of programs out of Iceland are an example. Um, there, is, there is a comment from Debbie Black, and I guess we'll call this the last comment. Uh, we help depressed people with personalised medical device that sit next, next to their bed as they sleep. Over time, it assists improve their assists improve their sleep and oxygen absorption, improves their mood, and we monitor them regularly. I can't often. I've got to make this bigger. Often, our regular contact with them is the only person they talk to in a month. Sounds yeah, a bit well, well, like my cardiologist when he picks up flutter from my pacemaker, but. <laughs> That's a great example. I mean, uh, having been down that path myself, Eugenie, I have a bunch of patients actually now who were told by their cardiologist they didn't have a heart problem. They now use a monitor and go back to their heart and go, yes, I do. And I <laughs> recorded it. They went, oh, 
I thought you just had a panic attack or anxiety and I previously told you you didn't. You go, actually, I have both. I have anxiety and I go record. So Debbie's point also about the social contact and being in contact with people who are otherwise isolated is a really important one. So the contact issue is important itself, the non-specific benefits of contact. And we see a lot of this with technology. We are in more contact with people. One of the advantages of telehealth with young people is actually the attendance rate at, at, at gone up because we go into their homes. They don't have to get to us. They don't have to get out of bed. They can stay where they are. Mm -hmm. So young people are actually using more services because of technology. On the issues just around sleep, there are a whole lot of issues around sleep wake cycles. And again, for another time, my favorite biology is actually related to circadian systems and the extent to which disturbed circadian systems lie at the heart of many major mood disorders and their metabolic and immune complications. But that's for another time. There are issues about monitoring and working out whether for you, that is one of the main drivers of the apparent mental health problem that you have. Well, I think we, Stuart's looking impatient. I, I think this is... Uh, been an absolutely fascinating session and I'll hand over to Judith Wilden to give the vote of thanks. Thank you very much, Eugenie. And I thank you, first of all, for such a, a talented handling of the question and answer session, which I always look forward to. So thank you for that. And thank you to Stuart and uh, Lindsay for the excellent work they do behind the scenes, making sure that we have a program that is as perfect and faultless as it can be. Our little disruptions were not their fault, um, but we had a great program in spite of whatever the weather was trying to do to us. Professor Ian Hickey, I must consolidate into a very small space. Great thanks already expressed by Eugenie. And I'm, Glad that she did that. Um, I had a hard time putting my thoughts together because I wanted to listen to every word that was being said, including in the question period. But I boiled it down to this, and that is uh, that I want to thank you especially for two things. First, the job keeper aha moment. The official recognition of the idea that investing in people is good for the mental health of all of us and that as members of society if we look after the well-being of others that affects our well-being as well and i'd just like to stretch that a little bit i think you will nod your head in agreement to education starting from preschool on domestic violence programs uh, sex education in our schools, which I think we understand over from the last few weeks, news events that we have very little um, understanding or good ideas about. And of course, very fundamentally racism in all its forms. And if we can apply to that, uh, the mental wealth concept that you've taken us through, if nothing else, if our humanity doesn't appeal to us, our self-interest might. And once that happens, maybe we can then understand the humanity and the better world it creates for all of us. In other words, it makes darn good sense. So thank you very much for that, for all the scientific support you gave so that we can see how you actually got there, that this is not just a, a nice set of words. But being that I am a person who cares a lot about words, I want to say I think the phrase mental wealth is extraordinarily valuable. And what you were able to do with it tonight was to manage what is, uh, to manage a positive approach to what is usually regarded as a topic that is only frightening, sad, and doomed. But the words mental wealth make us look at as you defined it, the collective cognitive and emotional resources of our community, all of which is a very positive thing and which we know we can take meaningful steps towards improving. So thank you for that. And thank you for letting me move on from that to add two more elements to your mental wealth. Collective cognitive and emotional resources, absolutely. But I think the Royal Society adds 
uh, intellectual and creative elements to our mental health. And we thank you for the intellectual and creative contribution you gave to us this evening as we finish our 200th year and begin a whole new century of encouraging the mental wealth, the intellectual discussion of our community. So I can hear a round of applause uh, among our audience uh, for the very stimulating session that you gave us this evening. Thank you very, very much for that. And if I can just add a different note, uh, remember folks to watch the uh, website for all the coming events, the Royal Societies of Australia and the branch meetings and our April 7th OGM meeting uh, with Leah Kanar Lichtenberger, which has the most enticing title, Antarctica, this ain't no mirage, the value of art in, uh, in disseminating scientific information. I think that sounds absolutely unmissable. And a week later, Ideas at the House will be on again, and our distinguished fellow, Tom Keneally, will talk to us about writing historical fiction, and in particular, his new book, The Dickens Boy, examining the life and experiences of the sons of Charles Dickens, who were shipped out to Australia for the term of their natural lives, but voluntarily. Uh, so thank you all for coming along this evening. And thank you especially, Professor Ian Hickey. Good night, everybody.